This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and tonight I just couldn't find a guest, so I had to dig deep, call a whole bunch of people, see if anyone would respond, and luckily, luckily, Tanner Brandt is just, you know, the all-around nice guy decided to uh, join me. Actually, I'm not kidding. (laughs) Okay, I am kidding. I'm completely kidding. We're uh, messaging about some events uh, that we'll talk about after a word from our sponsor, Napa Auto Tech Training. Napa Auto Tech's team of ASC Master Certified Instructors are conducting over 1,200 classes covering 28 automotive topics. To see a selection, go to NapaAutotech.com for more details. How's it going, eh? Good. about you? I mean, I, I don't, I'm not trying to be dramatic or nothing, but I got to say, I'm uh, taken aback. <laughs> I'm, uh, I shouldn't be surprised, but I guess I'm just kind of disappointed in uh, the state of our country. So for those of you that don't know, and I'm not sure how that's even possible, but we are recording shortly after the uh, assassination attempt on former president and Republican candidate uh, for President of the United States, Donald Trump, the uh, failed assassination attempt. Looks like they got clipped in the ear pretty good. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on with that that I don't know that we need to delve into. But there are things that definitely are worth discussing. I don't want anyone thinking that I think this is purely politically driven, that this individual is, what, 20 years old? Yeah. So I got a kid that's about that age. I don't know if politics is really the big driving force. Also some other issues. Uh, It looks like he was a registered Republican, but also donated to to the DNC. So I'm sure they'll, they'll turn up more and more about this character. Probably the, the most important thing is uh, somebody did get killed. Sounds like a, a father and protecting his family, presumably. The reason I guess I bring light to some of that is on social media, to a disgusting degree, <laughs> disgusting degree. There's individuals that are uh, upset that the uh, shooter did not take out the uh, candidate, former president, Donald Trump, which is uh, mind-blowing to me. That is mind-blowing to me. Like, whether you're going to vote for him or not, whether you like him or not, whether I, you hate him, fine. We want him dead? The hatred on both sides, because we look at not only our people, you know, we're saying that they wish he had succeeded, but also look at the people that immediately, like literal minutes after it happened, that were like, this was politically motivated. The left, you know, convinced this kid to do this, like the Democrats were behind it people saying also that like right from the get-go that it was staged by trump is like a political stunt like all this different just crazy stuff so everybody hates each other and everyone wants to blame one person or the other instead of sitting back and like you brought up it's a 20 year old kid and now a day later that we know more about it there's zero evidence so far that he like didn't have anything about politics on his Facebook. They found so far absolutely nothing in his life that said that he was like a political extremist or even paid any attention to politics at this point. For all intents and purposes, I guess I would say that he, you know, is from a more conservative family, it sounds like. Family was active at one of the gun clubs, things like that. So we see right off the bat that everybody that was jumping to conclusions of, you know, either A, that it was staged or that there was people behind it and like just wanted somebody to be mad at, which, you know, arguably when something bad happens, everybody's looking for somebody to be mad at. But it's just wild to think about that we are in a position right now where that is the knee jerk reaction is it was the left, it was the right, it was staged, instead of looking at it and going, wow. This is a really tragic situation. Why did this happen and what can we do you know, to prevent this? And obviously, there's some strange things, I think, 
in the situation that went on that uh, I have a lot of questions about, I guess, how it happened until everything comes out. You know, I don't think any of us will know how it managed to happen, but it seemed kind of chaotic that it even uh, took place. But we have to get to a point of where we kind of something like this happens um, or any type of shooting happens. And instead of, you know, immediately people jumping on Facebook and saying that it's staged or like making any type of terrible comments, you know, I don't think there's really a reason to post anything you know there's no reason to get on and just post stuff on your facebook or comment on things and start trying to blame people especially when obviously even you know 24 hours later more than 24 hours later we still know literally nothing about the kid other than everybody around him said he was a super nice person didn't care about politics like nobody had anything bad to say about the kid so far so obviously something a little wrong there and like why everybody's got to fight about it instead of going, wow, this sucks, and how do we prevent it from happening? Like, that should be step one when something happens, is this sucks, what can we do to help, and what can we do to prevent it from happening again? Yeah, or any violent response. You know, in this case, it's it's about as extreme as it gets. Looking at her profession, seemingly a struggle to have civil discourse and have people disagree and keep it about the disagreement. You know, it's easy to, I guess, throw the psychology stuff out there and active listening and stop listening just enough to be able to respond, like try to see what somebody's trying to say and quit going personal. Why has why it got to attack someone's character? We saw a little bit of that with uh, the NASDAQ stuff. There's two camps. The, the camp that's kind of for the... Um, requirement to have a VSP to use scan tool capable of uh, doing stuff with a mobilizer and those staunchly against it, staunchly against NASTF, which I don't know, not to sound like overly defensive of NASTF, but I think they're really the ones stuck in the middle of kind of delivering the message that this is what the OEs are going to do. This is how we get access. Here you go. That's a really good example of there's two sides and the two sides have to kind of work together to come up with something. So obviously it was put out there that this is how it's going to work. And then like in the very beginning, there wasn't the thought of, you know, how do we uh, make it work when it's offline so that people can verify it? Well, then it was realized, okay, that's a problem. People brought that up. So then that has to be changed to fix it. So it takes multiple people working together in different viewpoints to come together with an agreement to come up with something that works for everyone, right? We have to have discussion to make that work. And I think right now in politics, like you watch stuff go on in Congress right now when stuff gets recorded and they're just shouting at each other. It's whoever can shout the loudest. And it's like, this is why nothing gets done. Like, the reality is we have Democrats and Republicans and the hope was always that the two sides would work together with opposing views and come to something neutral, right? I mean, that's always kind of the goal, having opposing views. But that doesn't seem to be the case all the way up to the top all of a sudden. And I think that it's kind of like lead by example. And all of a sudden, that's the example now is, well, everyone up to the president is yelling at each other and people in Congress are yelling at each other. So it's okay to be disrespectful and yell. And now we're stuck in this spot where like literally nobody can work together. And it's like the trickle down effect right now of that is that like even in companies, nobody can work together. Like I would hate to be on a board right now with you know, everyone's like, okay, well, it's okay to yell at everyone now and just scream and then nothing gets done. And I think that's the reason too why we're seeing a lot of companies fail now or larger companies start to fail because I don't think anybody can work together and you know, get along, which is a big problem. Get along or I disagree with you on something, but it's got to be personal. You know, off the cuff, I don't know if there's something you and I would actually disagree where we're both on pretty far ends of the spectrum but I can't imagine one thing that you and I just do not agree on. And if we talk about it, we end up in a heated exchange over it, passionate exchange over it. I still, for the life of me, cannot see it endangering our friendship, causing us not to be able to go out for 
dinner afterwards because there's so many other things we agree on and get along, enjoy each other's company. So watching this in families, in neighborhoods, in friendships, and then quote unquote friendships on like social media. And I think some are legit friendships that fall apart because of social media. I struggle. I I don't get it. The amount of marriages that are falling apart because of one being Democrat and one being Republican, that to me is, I guess, kind of funny. My own parents are like this, but it's like a female is more likely, I guess I would say throughout history to lean and be Democratic and a male is more likely to be Republican. Like that just kind of seems to be the way it's shaken out when you look at like, I don't know, a lot of couples. And now all of a sudden it's a like divorce problem. And I'll be the first to say you and I both know that, you know, there's probably other problems there. However, like my wife and I know more than a dozen people in the last six months that have gotten divorced. And like not all of them were from politics, but some of them definitely were uh views have been changing and they can't even sit and discuss and I guess what's interesting to think about is that like when did it start going wrong? You know, you and I have always been friends and always been able to discuss things. And I guess I feel like most of the people that I'm friends with, I, you know, have that relationship with, like, I have some shops that (laughs) I have to love. I have some shops that are like extreme conspiracy theorists and even them I get along with. And I'm like, okay, like, tell me, go for it. Tell me your conspiracy. And then most of the time I'll just be like, oh, that's interesting. And like, I'm not going to argue with them and I'll sit there and talk to them about anything else too. But like, I don't know. I don't get angry at them. I don't know. I, and this is off the cuff. Like, I would never pretend to imply I've done any level of research. This is off the cuff. One, 24 hours news and global. Like, they report everything right away. And it's just all the time. So it started out on television, namely cable and satellite, if you will. And then now the internet. The other thing is not saying that there was like any one entity that regulated it, but I think the um, allegiances have shifted drastically with our media are specifically who provides us the quote unquote news. I don't remember it being so politicized, but again, when I'm a kid, am I paying attention to, you know, when it was Reagan and Mondale running Bush and Clinton, am I really paying attention to the different, news outlets having their own slant, but it just never seemed so extreme until maybe really around Obama, a really hardcore Trump that first term through. Yeah. I mean, you literally had one news organization saying he's losing and the other one saying he's winning. What? And and I'm not, I don't mean that like pro Trump. Like I think part of the reason I don't talk a lot of politics because I think people wouldn't like them. They wouldn't like mine where it's, I don't want to say I'm on the fence, but I would say I bounce from uh, side to side, if you will, depending on the situation, you know, probably lean a little more liberal on the social stuff and a little more conservative on the fiscal stuff. And I think that's like the large more portion of the United States population. I think suddenly we had this, divide that was driven by media of like that it's very important to like stick to party lines and same thing you brought up about like i feel like it wasn't always like that but again being a kid i guess i could have just like not realized that for sure but all of a sudden like we're very hardcore this you know we have to stick with our party and i'm like let me tell you both parties have had some terrible ideas and i don't know how anybody just sits and goes we're going to stick with our party regardless. Like, I, that blows my mind, especially here locally. Uh, we just went through local elections, and I don't want to pick on any one side, and I'm going to try my best not to. But I'm in South Carolina, so all of the candidates were Republicans. So I don't have another side to pick on. It was only Republicans. Not a single one of them had anything that they ran on. All of them ran on that I'm endorsed by Trump because. Everybody felt like Trump was this like marketing genius, which I don't have any argument to that. But so like that was their thing. Every single candidate. I'm like, okay, so like if you're voting, how do you make any decision of 
who you're going to vote for. You all ran on the exact same thing. <laughs> like, so, so I didn't get that. And I think that's kind of what went on with the media, too, is when he was uh, president that everybody looked at it and anything to do with Trump was going to get views. It didn't matter whether it was good or bad. This is what we're going to report on. I mean, for the liberal media, Trump was the best thing that ever happened to him. What with the amount of coverage they had and could do. It's so much so that when he wasn't president, he was still getting tons of coverage. Like all the late night shows, like every freaking opening monologue, they're still talking about him. Like you morons kept him relevant. If you if you really wanted to not ever see him as president again and you wanted to forget about him, if that was your goal, what you did the exact wrong thing. When I see like Trump flags or Trump stickers or anything like there was no other president that people like were like, yeah, we're going to put this guy's name on a flag outside our house. Like, so it's also interesting to me from a business perspective of looking at like the marketing side of it and stuff. But then from a like intellectual perspective, I'm kind of like, you realize that you're like fanboying over a politician, which is strange to think about. Like I wouldn't put like, I don't know, an actor's name on the side of my house. Be like, I love this guy. Like, I don't know, the whole thing, that side of it is very intriguing from a business perspective to me of like how that came to be and like him being a politician aside or him being president aside, like the fact that you have people that are like, yeah, we're going to put this guy's name like on our house and on a flag and we're going to fly, like whether, I don't know, I feel weird with putting anybody's name on like a flag outside my house. Like I say, I wouldn't, there's... People that I'm like, they're amazing. I've learned so much about I still wouldn't put a flag with them outside my house. Like, it's just a strange thing. I mean, if I was going to have an actor's name on my house, how do you not, how do you not go with Bruce Campbell? No one would think that's weird. That's, that'd be normal. Now you got me thinking I'm going to do that. But (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I just have to look and go throughout history. Is there like, I don't I'm obviously younger than most, but like, was there ever a president that we like made flags and like stuff for? I mean, during a election within like months of the election, I've obviously bumper stickers and stuff like that. But like, I don't know, the rest of it, I guess I feel like has never been a thing. I can't speak for like Washington and Adams and Roosevelt, (laughs) Lincoln. Maybe they did. I think Lincoln, they had a wrestling match. That's how they determined who the president was but i think i kind of got going on a tangent with uh, the 24-hour news cycle when the news became like a profit center and now you have strategies business strategies to keep people on your platform longer that i think that started uh the split that's when you started seeing the news itself having certain political leanings and maybe it went before that, you know, maybe I'm completely talking out of my tail, but maybe there are more leanings than getting very hard off of center where now because it is a business, a big business, they have to play on targeting audiences and and who they want watching their product and faithfully where if they're all providing fairly accurate news well, then it's a toss-up if I watch MSNBC or CNN or Fox News or you know, any number, you know, ABC, CBS, NBC type news providers, you know, the AP, that they're looking for a target audience. And then we can't forget, obviously, social media and the algorithms. The social dilemma is that documentary. I know I've done a episode with Scott Brown about it, that you you should be very, very scared of social media and you should be very, very scared is maybe not the correct word, but it should make you uncomfortable knowing what they're doing. Social dilemmas on Netflix, it should be required viewership for everybody. Watch it with your families, watch it with your kids, watch it with your coworkers, everybody that owns a shop over the course of a lunch or two, everybody sit and watch the social dilemma together. When you're done with that, everybody watch Idiocracy. You think I'm kidding. I'm not. When the algorithms are in place to try to get your attention as long as possible, that's how they get paid, is your attention. So they're watching very closely what keeps you on. 
And you know what it is? Stuff that enrages you. That's what keeps you scrolling. That's what keeps your screen time up. And now when you just think the quote unquote other side is just evil, you start qualifying the people that are quote unquote on that side as being evil. It's the most insane thing. When you have certain pundits, pundits, if if that's even the right word, and the the two that just pop in my head just off the cuff because it's kind of what we do here. I would say like Jon Stewart and Bill Maher talking about how you shouldn't really hate half the country. Say what you will about the last election. I'm not saying Trump won. I'm just saying it was close for whatever reason. And I don't believe that everybody that voted for Biden was just 100% rah, rah, rah Biden and 100% anti-Trump and vice versa. I don't think everyone that voted for Trump was just He's our guy, rah, rah, rah. I I think there's a lot of misgivings and a lot of little things that cause people to vote certain ways. I can't echo this enough. I had it on my Facebook page straight from Jon Stewart. Is like, this can't be real. This just can't be reality. And yet, here we are. The algorithms, so like, I guess to quick explain, if people don't understand what the algorithm or how the algorithm works is it takes anything you look at and then tries to match you with other people that have similar views while also giving you more or less people to argue with or like sharing things that people that your viewpoint agrees with sharing things that they are arguing with people about in hopes that you will then also argue with them and you can make your algorithm change like fairly rapidly, especially like YouTube. Um, man, you look up one wrong thing on YouTube and it just absolutely jacks you. <laughs> it just totally jacks your algorithm, like terribly. And so to try it, use YouTube as an example. And if you are somebody leaning Republican, look up things that lean Democratic. If you were Democratic, look up things that lean Republican. You don't even have to watch them. If you watch them for like two seconds, but just do that. Do it like 10 times a day, right? For like two days. And your feed will completely change. And you'll be like, I had no idea this stuff existed. And that, you know, this company existed, this news, st- like all this random stuff that will come into your news feed, whether it be YouTube or Facebook. If you do this on any of the, especially any of the metal platforms, it'll start to change your algorithm like immediately. You brought up about the like people saying that like Trump won or you know whatever, and the election was close. But how did how come we had all these people that were like hardcore like Trump won? There's no way that anybody voted for Biden. Well, it's because their algorithm on Facebook showed that everybody that they could see and everything that was shared to them was we love Trump and we're going to vote for Trump. So then everybody's like, well, nobody voted for Biden. Well, that wasn't the case because everybody that or I shouldn't say everybody that voted for Biden, but a lot of people that voted for Biden would have only saw things for Biden. And they also would have only had things associating them with that part of the political spectrum. So you can get to a point of where you're, you have a misconception of what way the world is leaning. And it doesn't matter again to me, I don't care one way or another, but you can get this misconception if all you're doing is using social media because it's going to just continuously show you things that you want to see that agree with you to make you feel like you're part of a community. That's how they get you to stay on. That's how they build a sense of well, belonging, I guess, for lack of better words. Napa Auto Tech training sessions are being conducted day and night in a town near you. This training caters to every level within your organization, be it a mechanical assistant, a mechanical specialist, a technology specialist, or a driver safety calibration specialist. Imagine a one-stop shop training partner in Napa Auto Tech that will lead your team to a path to greatness. Auto Tech's entry-level build-a-tech classes convert the untapped potential of your new hires into money-making mechanical specialists. Auto Tech's higher-level tech update classes introduce specialists to the world of ever-changing technologies, which prevents your shop from getting technologically stagnant. Remember, if you're not moving forward, you're falling behind. And, turning to the front of the store, the Auto Tech Service Advisor class is an awesome way to hone your client advocate skill set, ultimately benefiting the customer through an improved vehicle repair experience. But it doesn't stop there. 
Imagine an electric vehicle class that takes your specialist well past the mundane, yet necessary, safety topics. Well, it's here. Autotech's EV Ready Training is a week-long curriculum that takes participants through a hands-on experience involving hybrids and electric vehicles. The session kicks off with the use of PPE and proper tooling while touching on required OSHA regulations. Then, the students dive into the lab vehicles to gain knowledge of the common high-voltage components on EV and hybrid vehicles and their function. Attendees will be taken on a path exposing them to different electric vehicle manufacturers to compare component form and location. Additionally, information about Level 1 and Level 2 charging systems will be included, along with a quick look at DC to DC charging. The operation and maintenance of subsystems are explored, including the different modes of Tesla operations, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Commit to taking your business to the next level with Napa Autotech Training. If you start hating the other side, if you will, or the people on the other side to where you start unfriending people based off political views, you have now started to create an echo chamber. And that further reinforces the algorithms feed to you because now there's no one challenging you anymore. Even if they're wrong, they're forcing you to go look it up. But sometimes they're right. My example would be off the cuff. I think this was a few years ago, but there was a an issue in uh, Wisconsin with a kid who honestly shouldn't have been there, right? Just age and all that. But he was there. He shot some people. His name was Kyle Rittenhouse. The story was is he lived in Illinois, which I think was true, but he traveled there with his guns and everything with the purpose of, you know, white supremacy and all this. If you didn't have anybody who was leaning a little more to the right to challenge you on some of that. You would never see anything otherwise. You would never see what ended up being true. And I'm not sticking up for the kid, nothing like that. All I'm saying is a lot of the story that was put out there by big media companies, big news stations, news corporations was so wrong. Yeah, I think this is before Biden was president, basically calling the kid a white supremacist. It was all wrong. And nobody gets called to the carpet. Nobody gets called out. Nobody has to make a public, you know, a, a apology or retraction saying, like, we really screwed up on this. Or at least these points, right? You know what I mean? Like, so my, where I'm going with that is not trying to sell you on, you know, the innocence of Kyle Rittenhouse or anything like that. I'm, what I'm trying to point out is, is if you're disagreeing with people on your f- Facebook friends group or whatever friends groups, and you start blocking them, you start removing them from your friends list, you're now creating an echo, echo chamber where there's no one challenging your line of thinking anymore, which reinforces the algorithm already in place to keep feeding you more and more stuff. When it's accurate, yay. When it's not accurate, it's horrible horrible. I look at my friends group and I think I I have a pretty wide variety. I have people that I would consider very, very liberal. I also have friends that are very, very conservative. I would say I'm good friends with all of them. We disagree on various things. I have friends that are very libertarian and I feel like I need them to try to keep me where I want to be, which is really just, I want to, I just want to be right. <laughs> I want to know the truth or a reasonable amount of truth is what I care about. I could give a rip what the political leaning is. Is it right or not? Correct. Is it right? Is it going to help me? Is it going to help others? Like with specifically Kyle Rittenhouse in that situation, you think about like, should the kid have been there or not? And the big thing is like, he felt like what he was doing was right because likely the algorithm that he was looking at and people that he was talking with were like, yeah, we're all going to go there and we should do this. And like, that's a good point. Yeah. And you really think about like, he was a kid and he almost threw his life away because social media algorithm showed him something and made him feel like he was part of a community right or wrong. But you got to sit back and think to yourself of like, whether you agree with it or not of that, like that kid's life was almost over all because of social media. Guess what? 20 years ago, that would have never happened. That kid never would have been put in that position. And that's part of my issue right now with the 
two candidates that we currently have is looking at the age and I'm going to sound ageist for this, but I don't mean to, but like thinking about like Kyle Rittenhouse situation in particular, or really, I guess any kid of like, this is what that generation is dealing with. That generation is dealing with that they're being shown on social media, one thing or the other and saying that this is what's right. And if you want to belong, especially you think about like in school, a kid going to school, if like everyone in that school leans, say you're in an area where the entire town leans on the right and your family isn't. Now, all of a sudden, everybody that you went to school with is at odds with you and like you're the odd kid out. So now you're trying to fit in. There's just so much that goes on with that. And now all of a sudden, you know, that kid's opinion is being changed at 20 years old or well, I say 20 years at like 14 years old. It's when it's starting to change. And like before you're of age to vote, should any of that even be something you care about? Like definitely not. Like you would hope that Facebook would be smart enough to not show any of those kids anything to do with politics. Obviously they're not like, so, you know, you're putting kids in this position and nobody thinks through that side of it. And now we have this whole deal with politics where nobody can get along and nobody can work together. And the two that are running for president don't understand the situation that they're putting the youth in. And I would argue that most of the people that we have in any political position don't really understand the situation that they're putting the youth in. And now we have this situation that just, you know, played out yesterday with the, you know, assassination attempt. And guess what? It was another kid. And you look at the school shootings and everything that's gone on. It's pretty much always been a kid. And it's because the decisions being made are by people that don't understand anything that's going on with that. They don't understand how social media is affecting them. They don't understand how the news stations are affecting them or how the news stations and media is affecting the parents that might be affecting the kids. And there's no thought of that. And I unfortunately feel like unless we can get somebody like that is still of working age that has kids that are going through school and going through that, I don't think they'll ever be able to understand it. I mean, you look at, I'm going to pick on Trump and Biden, both for this, obviously. Biden's son is obviously nowhere near school age. And when he went through school, none of that was a problem. Trump's kids, same thing. Trump's kids are older than me. And when I went through, social media was not really a thing. I'm 34. Social media was just starting to become a thing, like with MySpace. And let's be real. Everybody liked MySpace, Tom. And like, we had a grand old time on MySpace. We didn't have the problems that we did on Facebook. Everyone learned how to code things. And then the guy sold the company and made millions of dollars. And now he's a photographer. So like, we had it pretty good. So what I'm getting at is the ones that are running, like, they don't understand that. And the ones that are in Congress don't understand that. So why are we ending up with all of these bigger problems? Because they've created a political divide and they don't understand what it's doing to the younger people. And then the big question I have is like, what happens 20 years from now? If we don't fix it now, it's going to get worse. Like, we have to start thinking through that. And... I would say it starts with us, you know, or not really us, the generations that are currently running the country need to think through and they need to lead by example and start getting, you know, people to get along. I, one of the things that had happened, uh, this happened, what, two years ago or something, it made national news of Biden had called, um, I think this was around Christmas time and he was like reading to these people's kids or something. It was like something that had happened on around uh, Christmas time. At any rate, the father got on the phone afterwards and was like, let's go Brandon. And then like, obviously he got a bunch of hate for it. And I'm like, that's like a perfect example of your kids had an opportunity to talk to a president, whether you like the president or not, your kids had the opportunity to talk on the phone to a president. And then you were disrespectful enough to say that whether you like the guy or hate the guy, like, you kind of just ruined something that was cool for your kids that they, you know, when their parents would be able to say, yeah, we got to talk to a president when we were younger. And then my dad made some stupid remark. Like, I don't know why you would make a disrespectful remark towards anybody at that point. Like, man, there's a lot of people I don't like. I still don't tell them off in 
front of people, especially not on a, not when I know it's going to be national news. But like that was the example led to those kids. So then those kids, obviously, for probably up until that happened and the dad got called out on it, like the kids were being taught that that was okay. And and I'm not one to tell people how to raise their kids, obviously, either. I don't have kids. I'm the uncle that teaches them terrible things so i shouldn't talk (laughs) about this but still like we have to think through it and it's that generation that's and and then you get the other side of it of oh you know well this generation's just soft and i'm like (sighs) that's what every older generation said about the younger generation correct and they're probably they're probably right to a degree for good reason but they're the ones that raised the right right (laughs) like okay your fault you raised them don't know what to tell you (laughs) Yes, you used to have to go to the bathroom outside. You had to carry your water into the house and then finally got indoor plumbing. Still had to go to the bathroom outside. Then you got indoor bathroom, toilet. And now the kids aren't as tough as they used to be because they used to have to go outside in the middle of winter to use the outhouse, you know, dig a new one from time to time or you know, whatever. Just, you know, everything was more manual. There wasn't mowed your yard with a sigh and sickle and manual rotary mower, you know, push mower. And it just, things get more and more convenient, more better, easier and easier. And then, you know, whatever the, that generation gets softer and softer. Do kids even know what the Dewey decimal system is anymore? I doubt it. Why? They just pull it up on their phones, but now they have to worry about, uh, bias, and I guess that's where I was going with. I think it starts with all of us starting to kind of, for lack of a better word, I suppose, grow up. Things don't have to be so freaking personal. And then I think our education system, the kids have to start learning about these social media algorithms. They have to learn about echo chambers. They have to learn about power. Power is a tough subject, but they got to. I think the younger, the better. A lot of the biggest tragedies we have in history, the human race, has to do with power and power dynamics. And I think talking about it would help people respect that power a little bit more and maybe shy away from it a little bit, maybe fear it a little bit when they're handed power, when they're handed power, given power, earned power, that they wield it a little bit differently than they would have otherwise. I think one of the things that they need to understand and on the power subject is social media is not a fake universe. Right. That seems to be like one of the number one things of like, I can say whatever I want online. And when I see that person or when I run into the person that I made the comments to that, well, that's, that's online. That doesn't matter. That's fake universe. Doesn't matter that I, you know, made some personal threat against them. And it's like, that's real life. What you said online still carries over to real life, even though you weren't in person when you said it and the guy didn't get the chance to punch you in the jaw. The next time he sees you, he is probably going to punch you in the jaw. And like, so we don't seem to understand that. So kids seem to like, I guess, grow up thinking that it's like an alternate universe and you can just say whatever you want and what you say on it is fake. And the anti-social network, it's a documentary on Netflix that gets talked about a lot and uh, that's has a like goes in depth about 4chan which is like this online chat room and it was basically a bunch of delinquents like when the internet first started although it still exists now just trolled each other and like it was all like fun and games and they understood that like this is all a joke and like everything we post is like fake but then as time went on the internet now looks at stuff on 4chan. There was just something posted on there about the assassination attempt and everyone's like reposting it now. And I'm like, this came from 4chan and they're like, yeah, it's real. I'm like, nothing on 4chan is real. Like (laughs) you need to watch the documentary and have an understanding of that. Like all that whole website is, is trolling. That's what it's been from day one. But because all of a sudden now we like think we can or still think we can post whatever we want on the internet stuff gets posted on there and then it leaks out of there onto Facebook and other various places and the people that are posting stuff I would argue that probably the people that are doing the posting on 4chan understand that they are 
100% just causing problems. I mean, when you watch the antisocial network, you'll find out that that's literally what all of them wanted to do. Trump's Twitter account got hacked, and it was a group of guys from 4chan that did it. And the guy that did the hacking and got his password is uh, is interviewed on it. And he talks about, yeah, I had it. This was his password. And he just rattles off his password. Yeah, we had it for like a month. And we posted all kinds of stuff from it. And it was confirmed. <laughs> That's what went on. So like those guys definitely, as they're posting stuff, know that what they're posting affects other people. However, the majority of people then seeing that or then reposting it on Facebook don't seem to understand that Facebook is real. Instagram is real. TikTok, wherever you're posting stuff. If you say something... It's real, especially if you say something personal or then if you're a kid, especially in, you know, your kid is picking on somebody else's kid. You may just be like, oh, it's just Facebook. You know, that may be the way you view it, but your kid probably doesn't view it that way. And he's got to see that person in school the next day. And that's what then ends up causing a lot of the problems. Or they're part of a a group, you know, whether it's messaging or pages and stuff like that, where now it's not just between two individuals or a small group and an individual or a small group and a small group. It's everybody sees it. Everybody. It's absolutely insane. The other thing is just watching what you're looking at in general as to depending on the news you're watching, it can give you a very, very, very negative look on just the state of the country, the state of society. And I'm not saying there isn't some truths to it. But also there's a lot of really great things going on. There's been a lot of really great things that have happened. There's a lot of things that are so much better than they ever have been. And you can lose sight of that. So you you have to make a concerted effort to go look for good things and spend time looking at good things, not only for your own mental health, but also to alter your algorithm a little bit so you do get fed some of the good stuff once in a while. Because otherwise, man, you could spend months online and just think this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And you just start getting depressed, just really cynical. And, I, I, you know, wh- wherever that takes, the, you know, different people are going to take it to different extremes or no extremes necessary, but they're going to handle it differently. Is there some truth to some bad things happening? Of course. Of course. There's also a lot of good stuff, and if you don't get to see it much, that it affects you. A little bit of advice there is there's a lot of really good things going on to go check out and and keep tabs on. And I, I would say I just uh, as you were saying that Googled happy news stations because I'm like there's got to be somebody that's capitalized on just. And there is. There's a whole bunch of them. I don't know anything about them. I don't ever pay any attention to any of the news. So, but there's a whole bunch of them. There's, if you Google it, there's good news network, positive news. Don't know what any of them are. Again, I haven't tried this, but it looks like there is some. There's even YouTube that says good news network. No idea what it is. So somebody's uh, at least thought through that. So there's got to be places to get news that are not uh, doom and gloom. And my advice would be if you are. Uh, somebody that all you watch is CNN, NBC, Fox News, and stuff on TV, like, they're always going to go after the, like, terrible stories. Sometimes we'll, like, my wife and I very rarely watch anything on the news. We don't have regular cable. We use streaming services. But we have, like, antenna TV as a backup. And once in a great while, we'll put on, like, 6 o'clock news. And I can watch it for, like, five minutes. I'm like, this is the most depressing thing. And then I go... This is why my parents are always mad, because they just sit and watch it. So also, if you're like my age and your parents are like in their 70s, you could also use parental controls and just block those channels from them. <laughs> so they won't be able to go back on and figure it out. And they're probably going to be happier. I have a rough time watching network TV anyways, just because the commercials are so dumb. I, just, I feel like I'm getting dumber watching them, and if I'm sitting around with family and they're watching commercials and laughing at them and just like, oh my God, everybody's getting dumber. Hence my recommendation, everybody watch Idiocracy. I I will say that is one thing that has gotten softer are the commercials. The old commercials were pretty good. (laughs) Uh, uh, But I guess the other thing I was going to bring, I was looking through my notes too, is 
if you're somebody that's struggling and you're just you find yourself on you get home at night and you find yourself on social media like arguing with people or literally just scrolling facebook and scrolling that stuff find yourself a hobby because even if you don't do the hobby every night when you start doing the hobby and you're talking about it or you're like doing anything in regards to the hobby guess what your phone's going to listen to you and a lot of old people are going to freak out here but your phone's going to listen to you and your phone's going to automatically change your algorithm so instead of seeing news things you're going to see things that have to do with your hobby and then you're going to start searching things to do with your hobby and you're just all around going to spend a lot more time doing that versus scrolling aimlessly at things that make you angry on politics and i guess like it's kind of shocking to me the amount of people that like I tell this and they're like oh I do have a hobby and like it's always they'll like say that it's something to do with politics or with like local politics or with a hobby that is tied to politics I'm like no 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 no. this is not what I'm talking about like you need a legitimate hobby that has nothing to do with any of this to get you away from it I ride bikes i am a road cyclist gravel cyclist mountain biker um, i played soccer growing up i know tons of people that still play in men's league uh, my wife is a runner we go hiking all the time like there's a plethora of things that you can find to do uh, in automotive if that you want that to be your hobby i mean if i'm not on my bike typically i'm screwing around with something with a car i have a new garage going in thursday and the garage is being built basically for research that was the whole reason behind building it is research and class development so i always find things to do that are not that that i'm not gonna sit there and look up stuff to do with politics like i I, can see it now six bays 18 (laughs) foot ceilings i wish 13 foot ceilings uh 26 by 35 two bays there was enough room for three but we did two bays um in an office on the end I'm on the side of a mountain, so I didn't have room for a six bay shop. Otherwise, I would have. <laughs> but we made it. I am going to put a lift in it. Uh, one bay for my wife's car, the other bay for mine and research. Uh, hopefully, in another like month, everybody will get to see it. We won't. I won't be doing uh, webinars from here. We'll move into there. But we didn't build a garage when we did the house because we knew we were going to be a do a detach. I just had to figure out where and how big I could fit and, and afford. That's the other thing. But so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's I mean, I know what you can afford and six bays was, <laughs> wasn't too far out. Uh, someday when Matt adopts me. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so that's my advice to try to like, I don't know, get yourself out of the, doom and gloom especially over the past couple days i mean with everything that's going on right now many pretty much everybody in america would be good to just stay off social media for the next like week and then you know i don't know start finding a hobby in that week that you take off i I would say too like during covid a lot of people found hobbies and then sort of when covid ended they you know stopped doing it or they have gotten older and they're like, well, you know, life got in the way. Well, take some time to pick them back up or find something like you got to do something that makes you happy and is getting you, I think all the way back to me bringing up the like Trump flag things. Like, I feel like that's kind of how that started as everyone's like, Oh, this is, this is cool. This is our thing now. And I'm like, that's, this is not your thing. Like you should totally just have some other, you should have a flag in your house. That's like something that you like. Yeah, like something that's, you see guys that are like into soccer and they'll you know have a flag of their favorite soccer guy people that are into nascar have flags for you know their favorite nascar driver like that i'm good with find something you like that you know you display that gives you that you want to you know put out there that is not something tied to politics yeah and i think amongst friends to try not to politicize everything although you know there are things that are It's just the way it is. I think we're just going to all be a little bit better about really listening. I disagree with you, but I'm trying to see your point of view. And and now that I see that, I'm now I have to, I'm not coming over to your side, but I'm, my stance is weakening a little bit because I see what you're saying. That makes sense. Or I do, I understand what you're saying. I, I, I completely hear you and I agree with you, but I disagree about what you think the effect of this will be towards that. That to me, you know, because earlier on I mentioned NAS stuff 
and I mentioned the OEs. Well, then there's also the some aftermarket, not some, but a, a bunch of aftermarket scan tool providers, uh, manufacturers have worked with NASTA for some requiring VSP and, and, and login credentials. And it's been some pretty heated discussions that got really personal, just odd. You know, if, well, you feel this way, you must not care about people or your family or it's like, whoa, what? Like, I get the concerns on one side. Absolutely. I also see what the other side is saying, like the the, the spectrum, if you will. It seems like there's a, a middle where I don't know if any of us agreeing on anything is going to change what NAS stuff's doing, what the scan tool manufacturers are doing. Uh, if ETI is involved, what the ETI is going to do or is being asked to do or told to do, I don't know. I just don't know that NASDAQ and ETI are the the bad players in this. I, I'm not sure. I don't think so. I, I think they're the ones charged with executing things to allow us access. But that's what I think is going on. Just watching some of these discussions devolve into like you're saying with Congress, just virtually yelling at each other, name calling and character challenging. And then what? They unfriend each other, they block each other, and then that does what? If I was in, like, if I sat in on Congress and I started talking and somebody just started yelling at me, I would struggle to not laugh at them. Right. Like that's, I would literally just start laughing and nothing would get done. And I'd be like, I I can't do this. Tanner's like, filibuster <laughs> technique. Start laughing hysterics. Yeah, be like, uh, this 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 really what we're gonna do in a this setting right now? Like, it's almost a contradiction where our leaders, our elected leaders, don't represent us for squat, and yet they kind of do. You know, with, with how they act, some of their behaviors. Yeah, you know what? That reflects a lot of people. On the flip side, no, I don't think they represent the vast majority of people, age and political leanings, if you will. Yeah. And like I say, they've gotten to a point where they're all like running on one specific thing, but none of them actually know what they're going to do, which I guess probably leads to the yelling. They're there. They're unprepared. Um it, I'm like one of the ones that I just recently watched was Pete Buttigieg was guys are going to hate me for this, but he was really tearing apart one of the other Congress members in regards to stuff with EVs and the other guy is just, I think I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. Just yelling at him. And I'm like, okay, everything that Pete is saying could have been Googled. Like every question that you have. And he's like yelling at him like, I'd like to see the stats. It's like, go to Google, type it in. Like, that's literally all that Pete did. Now, again, I don't care one side or the other, and I don't care EV, non EV. That doesn't matter to me. But, like, <laughs> Pete was sitting there going, These are the stats. And the other guy's like, Well, I'd like to see it. That can't be. And he's like, Go to Google. Like, all this is available to you. Like, and so then instead of going, Oh, well, could you explain your sources so I understand how to find that? Could we talk about, you know, how you put this together so that we, you know, see this because now I'm here, I'm unprepared. I didn't know any of this. And what, you know, somebody wrote me these questions and now I look like an idiot because I'm asking questions that I was unprepared for and don't like the answers when we could have Googled these and found them out. Like, so obviously now that guy's angry, but instead of yelling, he should have said, Oh, this is really interesting. Can you explain to me, you know, cite your sources so we can look all this up? Can we talk through, you know, how you were able to find this? Blah, blah, blah. Like, guess what? We would have learned something there. But no, instead they just yelled at each other. And like, I was like laughing as I'm watching this going, this this is like terrible because one of them came prepared and one of them didn't. But nothing's going to get done here because it was literally just like, let's yell at each other. This is people that are running the country right now that are yelling at each other. Like, really? Like, there's a learning that was a prime opportunity for both sides and everybody in that room to learn something. These are the stats that we found. These are how we found them. This is what's actually happening in the car industry. Being somebody that I guess you and I are experts in the industry watching people say things about the industry currently 
obviously EV is a big topic, but watching people like in Congress talk about EV stuff, and I'm like, you have no idea of what you're talking about. <laughs> like, for the love of God, just call somebody and ask questions or do like, find an industry expert. We are here. We will help you. But you can't yell at everybody. <laughs> like they're just woefully unprepared. And I feel like that kind of comes out in then yelling because you're upset. But they're missing the opportunity to then learn from it because they're too busy yelling at each other. It's an odd pride, I think, in ego. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ego is a big one. And I think part of that, too, who runs for politics now and why, you know, why do we have the two running for president that we do versus somebody younger? Um, And Obama brought something up. Oddly, I don't know if you ever watched Jerry Seinfeld, Cars and Coffee. Mm -hmm. Comedians and Cars. er, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking coffee, yep. He had interviewed Obama, and I'm pretty sure this is where – where Obama said it was on this show, because I used to watch it, and I'm pretty sure this is where he had said it. At any rate, he asked him, would he do it again? Would he become president again? And he said, no, because he goes, my life is over. I can't go get a coffee. I can't walk down the road. I can't do anything that I, like a normal human being. And my wife can't do anything like a normal human being. And my kids can't do anything like a normal human being. So everybody in the family's life is basically over at this point. So I think that because of that, if you're running for a political position, most of the time, I think there's either a, there's an ax to grind or, you know, you have a ego and you're like, I want to run everything. And that's not every one of them. However, I think because of knowing that like your life is kind of over at that point, that we don't get a lot of normal middle of the road people running, I guess I would say. Like most of what we're getting to run now is one extreme or the other or somebody with an ego problem. We're not getting that normal person anymore. And that's because now we have a bunch of crazy people that are like, We're gonna kill everyone. We're gonna try to assassinate a, you know, running or a presidential nominee and now nobody normal wants to run so like we have to also kind of think through that of like what does the future of that look like if we can't all calm down and get along like we're also probably not going to get decent candidates for anything the vast 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 majority do not get involved in politics until the big elections nobody's really getting in early on whatever caucuses and stuff like that to really find other candidates that normally like the last few decades just don't rise to prominence where we can start finding these, whatever they are, little more middle of the roads, better reflections of us. And then because so many more are getting involved early, maybe there's just not such the extreme leanings anymore. You might get to the point, and this is probably super optimistic, super optimistic. You might find ourselves, if that happens, you're getting to the poles and you're struggling between the two because the the differences aren't so terrific, right? Like there's certain, there's just certain points that they're running on that are so opposite that blow my mind to that they're actually opposite without naming them specifically because it could open up a can of worms that it blows my mind. Like I would just think for the most part, everyone just kind of agrees on certain things a little, probably more socially. And then even fiscally kind of figuring out, like I think from a purely economic standpoint, the middle class is not a direct result of our system. You try to be careful what you say because, again, you just don't want to just follow these big tangents and open up a bunch of stuff. But along with social media, we have a bunch of young people who are very anti-capitalism because their idea of capitalism is not what we have. They think what we have right now is capitalism, and it's not. It's more cronyism or crony capitalism. It's not that great. The middle class is not a direct result of that anymore. Or, or a natural evolution or a natural um, consequence that there has to be an investment in it. And I would think both sides would want to do that. 
but I, I both sides really I don't think do that very well. I think they're pretty good about raiding the middle class and then hitting. I think they're called super earners pretty hard. I think a lot of them, the super earners, are paying close to fifty percent income taxes. And then when you get into something called the super owners, those are the ones that are making millions and millions and billions and billions who are paying less than middle class and uh, even poverty, people in the poverty levels. And I'm not saying that the answer is to hit them super, super hard either, but I think there's better balance that focuses on putting money in people's hands that don't necessarily keep it the way the the top end does. And that when they ha- people have money, which I think we saw with COVID, when people had money and could spend it, it went into the local economies. We all want lower interest rates. I mean, that's a given. Every one of us, especially the younger generation, has to have lower interest rates to be able to buy a house. If we don't get interest rates down, the next generation is not going to be buy a, not only not be able to buy a house, but they're not going to be able to buy a car. The you know days of a seven thousand dollar car are gone. You know, we just bought my wife uh, new to her car, and like she wanted a small SUV. And man, if you buy any small SUV new, it's like forty five or fifty thousand dollars. It doesn't matter what you are. If you are a family that has kids and you need like a Tahoe or a Suburban or something, like you're talking seventy, eighty grand. So all of a sudden a eight percent interest rate on that is insane. So for younger families, we all want interest rates to go down. We all want, you know, less income tax. That would be ideal. Like there's things that everyone in America wants. And I think like, it's also always funny to me of like, people seem to think like one side or the other doesn't want that. And I'm like, literally everybody that is in America wants like those certain things. Like everybody wants to have more money, pay less taxes. I think the majority of us also know and understand that like we have to do something with healthcare at this point, what that is like, that's always up for debate. But like, we have to do something with healthcare. Healthcare is an absolute mess. And I think all of us understand that from it, like, I don't think age really matters in that because older people who are paying a tremendous amount of money for healthcare realize that like, that's a problem. And then younger people coming into the workforce that are like, I've never been sick before. I've never even like, just, I didn't, <laughs> I was bike riding with a guy that was a doctor and I asked him, this is just like two years ago. I'm like, doc, when should I get a physical? He's like, every year. When's the last one you had one? Or last time you had one? I'm like, uh, high school. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> and I graduated high school a year early. So I was 17. So it was 17. And he looks at me, he goes, you're an idiot. He goes, come to the office tomorrow, fill out some paperwork. I'll take you as a patient. So he helped me out. But like, I was paying a massive amount of money for health insurance. I had never gone to the doctor since I was like 17. So like younger generations also realize that like that's too expensive. So I think most of us all want, you know, the same things. However, like, and it's interesting to think about like, these are the things that are affecting us. These are what we want. Is any of that something that either political candidate currently is running on? No like the big ticket items of like things that they're talking about literally don't matter to most of America. <laughs> like, And I, I don't want to say, I don't want to sound like disrespectful and that they don't matter. However, like there's a lot of other issues that we have that matter more to most Americans at this point. I was just talking with a friend of mine from back home. Uh, he's a town councilman back home. And I brought up my thoughts on, the world right now and like politics is that we're like with both candidates right now, both candidates are at a point where like in four years, age is a problem. So we're not thinking past like a couple of years. I'm 34. I have to work for another 20 years. So I'm looking at, or at least 20 years, I'm hoping 20 years, maybe 30 years, depending. I'm looking at 20, 30 years down the road. What is the world going to look like? What has to change in order to make sure that the world is not a burning dumpster fire? Like, <laughs> And I also don't have kids. So one of the things that I have to give a lot of thought of is like, when I'm at a point where I can't wipe my own butt, I have to be somewhere that I can 
like rely on a good healthcare system and that I can have enough money to like pay a home health aid. If the world is a burning dumpster fire and like things like that don't get turned around, guess what? I'm going to have to move to another country when I'm like 70 and can't take care of myself because that's going to be my only option. So like I have to think that 20, 30 years down the road of like, what does the world look like? But not just for me. We also should be thinking about for the kids, like what does the world look like 20 or 30 years from now if we don't stop thinking about one or two years down the road? Like, it's just kind of mind-boggling to me. And I saw it back home. There's a city called Oswego where I'm from in New York. They had had the same mayor for like many, 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 many years. And the entire city was in like terrible disrepair. Like many, many buildings condemned. It's a college town. Um, just absolute slums that the college kids were living with or you know, living in, drug problems. The town was in bad shape. They get a mayor that is 24 years old that runs, and he runs unopposed. And he's in there for four years. Everything in the town or in the city is redone. He got grant after grant after grant. He put fines on all of the uh, landlords that had like these slums that the colleges were living in and sent a uh, building inspector around and basically they all got condemned and he gave them like X amount of time to fix them or they were getting torn down. And then they didn't think he'd actually tear them down. He tore them all down so that then they could sell the land to new developers. They've got brand new parks all around and it all comes down to that like the generation prior to him coming in did not care for so long that there was no future there for anybody. Like everybody was moving out of there and there was not a single park in town to take your kids to. There was no nothing. And finally somebody comes in and now all of a sudden it's like inhabitable and livable again and super, super nice and got all this money. And the only thing that changed is somebody came in and cared to do all that and said, okay, we're going to rebuild all of this, not only for us, but so that there's stuff for generations from now. But it's just wild to think that it got to that point, you know, that we just completely didn't care. And that's where we're at now with our, you know, major politics is we're not, we're thinking right now of what's, you know, the next two years or four years. And we're not thinking ahead of 20 years from now. And yeah, you know, there's just that drives me nuts. It's definitely a thought that's crossed my mind more than once where for things to get better, they have to really crumble. That's when there'll be a motivation to make it better and work together because they can figure out they can't do it alone. And so it has to get really bad for it to start getting good. You know, again, I, I don't want to imply that everything's just so horrible. It's not. There's things that are. are certainly better than they have ever been but we should be striving for better right that we do that with our businesses or we do that as techs we're just always striving to be better every day every year get better whatever that means more knowledgeable more productive i mean i i would think that should just kind of be the goal of pretty much everything i mean let um you know physics do the uh entropy and we can try to fight it. Yeah, you know, I point people to social media a lot for joining groups, but got to keep in mind what's going on. It's just hopefully a, a healthy awareness uh, is enough to uh, keep some of the really bad stuff of what social media can do from really affecting you and your behavior and your thinking. You know, and when you start having really negative thoughts of people and things, that's a time where you got to think about a social media diet or just stepping back, taking, taking pause and going, all right, how much of this is objectively true? You know, is this person really bad? You know, are they really nefarious? Probably not. Can we find some common ground and build from there? That's what I would like to see a little more often and not that every group just devolves into mudslinging and everything, but just, uh, 
more often than it needs to have, you know, and animosities. I mean, I just don't see the point. <laughs> right? I, I just think everybody, for the most part, can have a pretty good amount of respect for each other and then discuss points and, and bring bring our uh, reasoning and logic behind it and data, if that, you know, there's data to back up what we're saying. Find out maybe people move more towards you know, the opposite end of what they were thinking earlier, maybe the opposite, maybe you're find that you're being convinced otherwise, like, Oh, this data is overwhelming. I, I, I can't ignore this, but yeah, it's, it's just too easy to buy into this. Um, I, I don't know. I, I guess I don't have a better word right off the bat than animosity. And, and we're seeing it in front of our eyes. <laughs> it's just, uh, and, and not just talking about the shooter himself, but the people, people's reaction to that, like it's, it's pretty stomach churning and, and not just seeing it on social media, like hearing it from people. Yeah. Opinions being formed with zero information so far. And like, I think to summarize, everyone has some homework. You have to watch the social dilemma, the anti-social network, idiocracy. Yes. And, I, and I'm going to throw one more feel good in there because I think that everybody could use this as Ted Lasso. That's a really good one that everyone <laughs> has to watch. There's a lot of life lessons there that can, uh, there's a specific life lesson in there. For exactly some reason what, I thought you were going to say we bought a zoo, but <laughs> no, <laughs> um, there's a, they talk about, uh, like being mean to each other. Cause in the UK, that's a big thing, <laughs> but that gets discussed about like, you know, things that you say are, uh, real and can be hurtful and can upset other people. Um, so those are your things to watch. And then you have to find a hobby. So hopefully by the end of next week, I expect everybody to find new hobbies. Brian Pollock and I have uh, grass mowing cornered, so find something else. <laughs> 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 or join the club. Uh, I think the cost of entry is... I haven't discussed this with Brian, so I'm probably speaking out of turn. He'll have to uh, come on and elaborate, but I'm pretty sure it will involve Skag, Xmark. Uh, I would argue for Walker. Uh, there's some lines of Toro I think we could allow in, and Hustler, just to name a few. And then uh, I don't know. Well, I guess we'll come up with an official list. So <laughs> I always had a Ferris. That was what we oh, had. Oh, that's another good one. You got the uh, suspension. Nice. Ferris is definitely on that list. Not because you have one. Okay, probably a lot. Had, had one, had one. I don't have any grass oh. mow now. Now, now I live now on a mountain. One. I don't have to mow. I live on a mountain. Oh, the grass just falls off the side of the mountain? What? Pretty much. Well, as of right now, we didn't plant any, but I literally only have like one spot that's going to have grass. you have to grass. rock climb to get up to your house? Uh, If there wasn't a road, you would. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go to Tanner's house. We're having a hang. <laughs> invited everybody to hang out bring your ropes <laughs> oh man thank you very much for coming on sir of course thanks for having me anytime literally anytime thank you everyone for listening I uh, hope you got a kick out of this if you have any uh, thoughts or ideas about the podcast or you'd like to be on the podcast please don't hesitate to reach out you can email me at mattfonslopodcast at gmail.com I even respond to those emails. Thank you to Nap Auto Tech Training for sponsoring, and thank you to the Aftermarket Radio Network for uh, just allowing me to do this. So until next time, take care. You've been listening to Matt Fonslow diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.